Good church. Glad you're here today. Let's stand together if we would. Psalm 145 verse 3 says that the Lord is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Oh Lord my God.
It's good to see you this morning. I'm glad that you're here. I'm Dale Moreland. I'm the associate pastor for those who are our guests today. We are glad that you're here uh, to worship the Lord with us. God is uh, doing great things at the church at Quail Creek, and we just praise him for all he wants to do in our hearts and our lives. Next week is going to be a special service here at Quail Creek. Uh, we'll have our baptismal service, so if you're here this morning and you have invited Jesus Christ into your life and, and you haven't been baptized and you would like to do so, be sure to come up to Kyle and myself and the staff and you can call the church office to let us know. But uh, next Sunday we would be honored and it would be such a blessing to our church family to see you uh, follow the Lord in baptism. It's going to be a great day. Well, if you're a guest here today, we're excited that you're here. And uh, we have a number of folks who visit our church each week, and we're so honored and blessed to have you here today. In the pew there in front of you, you'll find the Connect card. If you would take that card and just fill it out, or you can use the QR code. We just want to have a, uh, know who you are so you can get to know us better as well. And uh, if you would fill that out, and maybe you're here this morning and you have a special need for prayer. Every Monday morning we gather for prayer and we pray for the needs that's listed on these cards as well as if you post it on Facebook, we uh, take those and we pray for you I, every Monday. So you're being prayed for. If you have a special need, if you'll fill that out and then you can put it in one of the boxes here at the front or at the back and or you could give it to us. But uh, we want to be able to pray for you. Well, as we continue to worship the Lord, let me pray for you this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this day. Father, you're preparing our hearts, even as we sing praises to your holy name, to the word that uh, Brother Kyle is going to share with us today. So, Father, continue to open up our hearts, for it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand together. Acts 4.11 says... That this Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Oh, Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad than I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. 
419 says, when the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul.
foundation. You are the rock upon which we stand. We celebrate today, the Sunday after Easter, a risen Savior. God, we celebrate every Sunday a risen Savior. God, we can truly say that it is well with our soul because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross for us. God, he died the death that we deserve to die. He was placed in the tomb, but Lord, we praise you that he did not stay in the tomb, that three days later he rose victoriously. Father, he's seated at your right hand, and one day he will return to take us to be with him. And we thank you for the promise that he made to his disciples in John 16, that in this world we will have trial and tribulation, but we can take heart, for he has overcome the world, and he's given us the gift of his Holy Spirit. So, Lord, today we can truly say, for those of us that know you, God, that it is well with our soul because of Jesus and what he has done for us. Thank you, Lord, for this time to come to sing your praise today. Lord, I pray now as we open your word, God, speak to us today through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you, church. Be seated if you would, please. Before we begin in the text, I, I wanted to give you an update on what's happening on the other side of our building. Um, for some of y'all that may not know, um, more than a year ago, we had uh, a major leak, a flood in our building. It took out the majority of our kids' wing, took out our elevator, it, it did its work. Um, since then, we have been working towards getting that renovation done, and a part of that was asking y'all to pray. And I hope that you're doing that. Out in the foyer, there's a, a card that every day of the week you can join us in prayer and praying for the safety of those workers, praying for the completion of the job, things like that. I hope you're praying with us over that because it's vitally important. The other part is you can give. And as of today, um, we have a goal of about 210000 We're about a quarter of the way there to finishing phase two in giving, uh, right at $51,500 in giving. Amen? It's powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Um, so I want to talk to you real quick about how you can give, because I think there's a, a large intimidation factor when it comes to big giving towards a program or a building or something like that. Let me tell you how it works. Uh, while there's bound to be somebody that could just write a big check, for most of us, that's not what we could do. What we could do is make a plan and put forth a thought of, what could I do? Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but the majority of building programs as they're happening are not completed by big gifts. They're completed by small gifts that are happening all the time. So I want to give you a challenge today. Here's your challenge. This week... Well, you would, when you would normally go out to eat sometime this week, instead of going out to eat, stay home, and what you would have spent there at the restaurant, bring it to church next week and give towards the kids' building. That little bit of gifts, if we all play our part, will take care of funding our kids' wing completely quicker than you could ever imagine. Small gifts, as we all do it, make a big difference. And so I hope that you'll plan and prepare to give small. You'll prepare to give some um, because it matters. 
And as we're seeing the building kind of taking steps, I hope you'll do this. Um, come by the church office and ask, can I take a look? We'd love to show you what's happening in that wing. A lot of things are happening and things are getting done. Uh, it's just going to take some time. So please come by and ask the question. And we'd love to show you around that end of the building and show you all that's happening. Okay, now I'm going to turn that switch off and we'll get to the word. Let's pray again and we'll seek the Lord together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you do in our lives. Lord, we want to be marked as people that look like you, that act like you, that do the things that you hope that we would do. And so today as we open your word, Lord, that's exactly where we want to find ourselves. And you shaping us into who you want us to be. And Lord, I believe that when we act like you, the world will see a substantial difference. And so Lord, would you lead your church to do just that today? And in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. How do people know that you're a Christian? So let, let's move beyond just proselytizing them. You know, let, let's move just beyond being evangelistic. How did Jesus say people would know that you're his? So before we get to our focal text today, and this won't be on the screen, this is for any of y'all that will grab a Bible in the pew in front of you, or if you have your Bible or your phone, uh, open it to John 13. This is uh, not going to be on the screen for a second, but we're just going to look at a text and then we'll get to our text for today. Uh, In John 13, the text that we're about to read uh, together, um, I want to go further in John 13 to where we won't be reading today. In John 13, 34, John 13, 34, here's the words of Jesus. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you're also to love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. How does a lost world know that we're Jesus's? By love. That is something that the world is having a tough time identifying what it is. You see, we've made love into a category of novels, like the love and romance section of your favorite bookstore. In fact, we've made love a Hallmark movie, or we've made love a campaign to run upon and march for. You can just see it in our society today. Love has a lot of answers. The problem is we're having trouble defining it. The Beatles sung about it. All you needed was love. Love, love is all you need, right? They weren't wrong. They just didn't know how to define it. Uh, Like I said before, my dad and I had an amazing trip several years ago to India. And while we were there, we went to the Hare Krishna Temple. This is where George Harrison sat under his guru and learned to play the sitar. We walked into that temple, and upon the far wall are these massive golden statues. And each one is doing some pose. It's, it's holding something, and it's hands up. And as the particular worshiper would get there, they would hold their hand up and hold their hand out to echo what they saw. And they would just move down this line of worshiping these golden gods only to find out that these gods never said anything to these people. They were just statues. And what was crazy about it is, as we walked in, and none of us said anything to each other, but we all felt it at the same time. As we walked in, it felt like something sat on my chest. Almost like you couldn't take a full breath in there. And it wasn't because there was incense or anything like that. I just, when I walked in, I felt... Like I needed to run. In the middle of the room was the teenage worship band playing out their higher Krishna songs. You know, sitar and drum and singers. On the far other side of the temple was one of their former gurus that had died sitting, uh, you know, with his legs crossed. And they dipped him in gold and put him in this case like an entombed man so that they could go. That was the greatest guru that was ever here. As, as we walked out, we walked through the Walmart of Hare Krishna. I mean, there was cookies and kids' movies. And we walked out and we finally got outside. And it was like, for the first time in several minutes, I went, <sighs> I just remember thinking, what just happened? 
You see, here's the problem. That is how our world feels. And they're searching for the answer for how to take that deep breath again, and they don't know how. And so they begin to live their lives with so little of what God intended for them to have. Let me tell you what God gives everybody. Life. Breath. Hair number. Length of days. God gives that to everybody, which means this. If we believe the Bible is true, everybody that (sighs) took a breath, that was God's gift to them. So everybody's given so many God-given things. They just don't know how to take in a deep enough breath because they've never experienced what it's really like to breathe in the forgiveness and love and compassion of God. And so God does something amazing. He sends out his church with air. And he says, go breathe what I am. And that air is love. How does God define himself? God is love. So what should Christianity look like? Love, right? That's, that's what we should be great at. That should be what we have in aces. When the lost world looks at Christianity, they should see people that love deeply. I mean, let's just, let's talk for a second. If you were a good Catholic and you did not celebrate the Pope, it, you, you, you diminished his office, you didn't care about him at all, you couldn't identify yourself as a good Catholic. If you were a Muslim and you did not practice your daily prayers and you did not go on your pilgrimage and you didn't do the things that a Muslim should do, you could not characterize yourself as a good Muslim. But in Christianity, we are called to be people of love and a world searching for it. This is the problem. And Jesus saw it. John 13, verse 1, it says this. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from the world to the Father. Having loved his own who who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love that this is, by the way, how verse 1 ends. He loved them to the end. Because that was frustrating. You ever loved somebody, but they just acted dumb all the time? Mom and dad, quit looking at me like that. Um, but, but you loved them, but you're just like, this is why animals eat their young. Um, you, you just look and you think, really? I, oh. But you love them? This is Jesus with his disciples. It says, now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put in the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you don't realize now, but afterward you'll understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only wash my feet, but my hands and my head. The one that has bathed, Jesus told him, does not need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him, and that's why he said not all of you are clean. When Jesus had washed their feet and put his outer clothing, put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're speaking rightly since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I've done for you. Truly, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a master is not greater than the one who sent him. And if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you'll believe that I am he. Truly, I tell you, 
Whoever receives anyone I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives him who sent me. This moment, I think if you spend any time in Scripture, you've heard this story. But I think what happens in this moment is so pivotal for who we should be as Christians. What is the example that Christians should emulate? What's the example? Jesus himself, right? Jesus never asks us to do what he never did. In fact, everything he does, he calls us to follow him and do. And so in this moment, Jesus is like, listen, I've got to show them this so they get it. Because all they want to do is crown the Messiah. They don't understand my purpose. And so you can just imagine in the middle of the supper, everybody's talking. Jesus just kind of calmly gets up from the table. And he walks over to the worst job there is. He takes out his outer cloak, wraps a towel around himself, and he looks the part of a low servant. This is that job. This is the job that you didn't want to have. I mean, this is a servant that typically was the lowest rank of servants. They were the servant of the servants. And they had the job of, as people came in to eat and recline at the table, you didn't want to smell feet. So you would take off your sandals. You would sit. The servant would pick up your feet. They would clean your feet dry your feet, and then you would walk towards the table. Because at that point, you didn't smell the feet, you smelled the food. But you know what that servant smelled like? Feet. I can't imagine what that servant, what their lives must have been like, but at this point, Jesus knows what he's going to smell like for the rest of the meal. And so he sits down. And one by one, Jesus takes the feet of a disciple and washes their feet. And you can just see them all going, what's he doing? What's he doing? Next guy's going, I'm not going to say anything. I mean, it's Jesus. He knows what he's doing. But then appears my friend. I love Peter so much in Scripture because he says what's on his mind. And he's like, listen, I, I may constantly have sock breath but i'm going to say it anyway because his foot was always in his mouth but he, he looks at jesus and he's like huh, hold up you're not going to wash my feet i like to think that peter's feet were the worst i just do i don't know if you've ever been in a, a moment a ceremony a disciple now a, a retreat where all of a sudden the speaker goes and now I'd like everybody to kick their shoes off and take their socks off. I'm going to wash your feet. And to see that one or two people that are like, I suddenly have to go to the bathroom. I'm never coming back. Y'all, have y'all been there? So this is Peter. He's like, uh-uh. nope, you're not washing these bad boys. And Jesus says, you don't understand something. I'm trying to teach right now. And if you don't want me to show you this, You'll never do it. And so Peter goes, okay, let's at least elevate your office. Wash all of me, because that's a better servant. That's what a better servant would do. The foot washer is a bad servant. The full body washer is a palace servant. They're elevated. They've made it. They've gone from foot washing to face washing. And Peter's like, if you're going to be a servant, be a better one. Watch everything I got. And Jesus is like, Peter, quit trying to teach the class. Just listen for a second. Just, Peter, can you stop talking? You don't understand. Those that are clean don't have to have cleaning again. I'm just trying to wash your feet. So just let me do what I'm doing so I can tell you why I did it. So you just kind of imagine all the talking, all the laughter, and then Jesus now washed the feet, and they're all watching him put his outer robe back on and sit down. And they're all going, tell us why. And Jesus goes, oh, you guys, this is how this looks. 
Y'all have missed this time and time again. I did not come to be crowned. I came to be servant. Because what I'm going to do is better than you could ever do by going to any temple in any place. Better than walking every road and talking. I'm telling you what I'm doing by dying for you is so much better than any sacrifice you could ever bring. Amen. Don't forget this, church. If Jesus is our example for Christian living, don't you think we should know him? That's why we're reading the New Testament together. That's why we've made this agreement together that we're going to spend the time this year slowing down to find him. When I was young, my cousin got a Where's Waldo book for Christmas. I'll never forget going to his house and in his room, he had like two or three of them and we would just lay in the floor and we would search for Waldo and then you had to search for scrolls and you had to search for his, his like walking stick and then the wizard and then his hat. And I mean, you would just spend hours pouring over a page going, I think that's it. Do you think this is it? And we would search and spend the time finding Waldo. This is exactly what Jesus is hoping his church will do is pursue him, not only with time, but to do so intelligently, to really slow down the pace and find him. You know, y'all remember those pictures that were all scrambled looking? And I've never learned how to do this. I have one good eye and one bad eye, so I can't see in 3D, nor could I ever see these pictures. But like you'd go up real close and you'd back away and your eyes would go crossed. And, and then all of a sudden this crazy picture would become a guy on a skateboard or a, a whale jumping out of the water. It always became a blurred picture to me. I always thought, this is abstract. We should just appreciate it. Look at what you did. But my friends would be like, oh, you can't see it. It's the dude all in on a skateboard. And I'm like, nope. Because to me, I could never see it. It was there, and they could all see it. My next friend, without being told, would be like, oh, it's a guy on a skateboard. And I'd be like, I can't see it. And they'd be like, oh, but the skateboard's here. Just look here. You can see, like, the wheel of the skateboard. And I'd be like, nope. Then one time I was like, oh, yeah, I totally see it. Yeah, it's a guy on a skateboard. They're like, no, this is the whale. I'm like, that's what I meant. It's a whale on a skateboard. He ate it. Um, I, I could never see it. Our friends that don't know Jesus can never see it. Amen. They just can't see it. I believe this. I believe there's people today that want to. They just don't have any gods to help them. And they're searching, but they can't find them because the church doesn't look like the church. They look like a smaller little church with a small C. I'm talking about they look like Quell Creek instead of Jesus. They look like churches down the street with their own titles and names. And so when we show up in their world, we, we look like us. <laughs> and the lost world doesn't need us. In fact, the lost world looks like us. So what's the difference? Why not mow their yard on Sunday morning? By the way, I believe if you mow your yard on Sunday morning, it's easier to mow on Sunday than any other day of the week. I believe the weather is better to play golf on Sundays than it is on Saturday. I believe the pool has better chlorine on Sundays. I believe that you would catch more fish, shoot more deer, find more bargains on a Sunday than you could ever find on Monday through Saturday. I believe it. Because I believe our enemy, the devil, is like, why not? And the saddest part about it is we've, inside the church, we do the same thing the lost world does. We look just like them. We act just like them. And Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, you can't look like them. You can't. How many priests do you think got on their hands and knees and washed feet? Zero. I guarantee you zero. But here is the Messiah. Down low to stinky feet. And he's like, I hope you get this. This isn't about your feet. It's not about the water. 
It's not about drying. It's about the heart behind it that I hope y'all get and pass on. Because if y'all could fall in love with a world and show them me and how I act and how I look and how I speak, they'll be changed. But if you look like you and you act like you and you talk like you, they'll never find me. I'll just be a blurry picture on the wall. Jesus chose to set a servant example for us. Instead of being kingly, he became servantly. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says that you should adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had become a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I've read this passage several times that every time I get to verse 11, verse 11 reads so differently for me. You know what? This doesn't say that every person will be saved. It just says that at one point... In eternity, every tongue will confess that Jesus is who he says he was. And it will bring glory to God even though they will admit it and know they'll never partake of it. But my prayer is this, that you and I will keep loving our neighbors when they don't look like us, when they don't act like us, when they don't vote like us, when they offend us, when they enrage us, we'll just keep loving them because Jesus loved us in spite of us. Because there is not one person on planet earth, not you nor I, that deserves his love. Not one of us. And because of that, you and I can love people that we don't like. Did you see anywhere that Jesus says, You'll know my disciples by how they like each other, how they show likability. That's not what it says. You and I cannot act on behalf of people that we just like. That's not our calling. That's not what Jesus did. In fact, Jesus kept putting his disciples in places with people they didn't like. Samaritans and foreigners and chief of Roman guards and and the worst of the worst of the priests uh, amongst tax collectors and prostitutes and drunkards. Jesus just kept putting them in these places and going, isn't this uncomfortable? This is awful, isn't it? This is awesome. Love people. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people in Scripture I probably wouldn't have gone to their house. I, let's just be honest. You wouldn't either. The people that despise you, that talk bad about you, that ridicule you, Jesus showed up at their houses. And he's just like, hello, I'm Jesus. Change. Here's some love. And they went, I have to. I have to change. I have to because there's love there. there there's something about you. We can't claim we know Jesus without adopting his nature. Amen. You can't claim him and not look like him. You can't say you're a Christian and not act like him. So you can't claim that you're his and not be adaptive to who he is. Amen. It's incompatible. You can't live like the enemy and act like you love Jesus. Doesn't work. And I believe the reason we're seeing what we're seeing in culture is not because the church isn't everywhere. I just believe Jesus' church shows up like the world and acts like they know Jesus. And a lost world goes, we know Jesus too. We've watched the History Channel. In fact, I'm just going to tell you something that may blow your mind. I believe there's a lot of lost people living amongst our city and around the world that know more Bible than you and I do. 
If you want to get in a debate with them, they're probably going to quote more Scripture than you will. They just don't believe it. Listen, I've read The Art of War. I'm not joining the Chinese army. I mean, I've read it. I I understand what it was talked about. I I get it. I, I thought it was great. But it didn't move me to move over there and join the army to go, hey, I've learned all the tactics. Let's go. So how do you help your neighbor to not just be a reader of the word? You have got to act like Jesus. But how? You get to know him. And once you start to do that, you will show up like love more than you show up like you. And that's what a lost world needs. For God so loved the world. He loved the world. You know what the world looks like? I mean, if we were to define the world, none of us would say, it's awesome. It's amazing. We would say it's broken. It's mean-spirited. It kills each other. It lies. It steals. The world is falling apart. In fact, I'm getting so old now that I, I start to tell my kids, well, when I was young, it wasn't like this. I remember my parents doing that. Well, when we were young, it wasn't like this. And their parents said, well, when we were young, it wasn't like this. And then we all hear the same thing, right? How can it get any worse? (laughs) Wait a day. That dumpster fire just gets bigger. But God so loved the world that he sent Jesus into the dumpster for me and you. And God so loved the world that he's sending you out of this place to find those that are searching for true love and you're his plan. You're his plan. You and I are given the opportunity to join Jesus in his plan. But our lives have got to do something. And this is, this is what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples that day. Verse 16 of John 13, he says this, Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger not greater than the one who sent, that sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those I've chosen, but Scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread is raised until it gets me. He's talking about the, the disciple that would betray him. But then he says this, I'm telling you now before it happens so it won't happen Um, So when it does happen, you'll believe that I am he truly. I tell you, whoever receives anyone I send, receives me. And the one who receives me, receives him who sent me. Our lives have to identify their leader. Our lives have to identify their leader. So my question to you today is this. If you today are saying, I am a Christian, what you're saying is, Christ, Jesus Christ himself, is leading your life. And he will give you direction, and he will motivate you, and he's going to change you. But you got to spend time with him. you got to be refined by him. you got to allow him to change your soul and your heart and your motivations. It doesn't mean that you get to leave this building and go, hate, 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 hate. It means you get to go, I am deeply loved. When I don't deserve it. And I am so far from perfect, it's not even funny. But if he can love me, I know he can love you. So let me tell you about the Jesus that loves me. That's what his church looks like. That's what we should look like. And the question I have to ask you today is this. Do you personally know that love? Do you know the love of Jesus who forgives you of your sin, wipes it clean, and makes you holy when you can't do anything to do that? The most amazing thing about Christianity is this. While we become obedient, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. Even those two actions don't make us anything. He does it. He makes us holy. Our action is just an obedience to listening to him and saying, I agree with you. But it's not about walking an aisle that doesn't save you. It's not about getting baptized that doesn't save you. He does it. And our obedience opens 
his work. So let me ask you something. If you know this Jesus and his love for you, why aren't you saying yes to being obedient to him? The second is, if you don't know him, why wouldn't you want to know him today? And the last is this church. If we claim him, do we look like him? Lord, may you refine us to look more and more like you in our lives. May we show love to a world that is desperately searching for it. And may they be one to you. Let me pray for you today. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends in this room. Many that may not know you as Savior and Lord, but today, God, I pray that you would meet them right where they are. That today would be their day. That they would, just as Scripture says, confess with their mouth and believe in their heart and that you would save them today. Lord, for my friends that do know you as Savior and Lord, I pray, God, that we would act more like you. Lord, and that's just my prayer. Lord, help me to act more like you. Help me to be obedient with my life and how I react and how I speak and the things that I allow in my life, God, to echo the things that you would do. What's more, Lord, show me that there is a world outside of my view of people that are far from you, but that you love so desperately that you're sending me to meet. Lord, would you set an arrangement for each of us in this room to meet somebody this week that needs to hear about the love of Jesus for them? God, thank you for this opportunity that we could be a part of anything that you're doing. So Lord, we choose to worship you and be obedient to you today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to have another song of worship. All right, friends down here, we'd love to talk to you about Jesus. So don't leave this room without that question. How can I know more about Jesus? I'd love to talk to you about it. As we worship, you come.
you're solid rock. He is our foundation. So let's sing this today as a declaration of our faith and what he's done for us. Oh, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me. Lead your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Oh, and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Lord, your word says in Psalm 56, verse 3, that when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. What can man do to me? Lord, we put our trust in you. God, when we are afraid, we put our trust in you in this moment, in every moment, God, because you are our rock, our firm foundation. Lord, as we've talked about today, Lord, as we go from this place, God, may our lives emulate that of our leader, Jesus. God, may we not seek to be the ones who are being served, but may we seek to serve others and tell them about this great God that is our Lord and Savior of what he's done for us, God. And then, Lord, as you give us opportunity to make much of those opportunities, God, and to share our faith, Lord, to plant that seed, God, that you would come along and water it, God, and that many would be added to your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time to sing to you today, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here, church, today. Hey, that green card that Dale talked about earlier, if you filled one of those out, please place it in one of the offering basket, baskets on your way out. God bless you. You're dismissed. We'll see you next Sunday.